Sorry, don't mind me. I've been told this is the kind of content you have to make if you want to have an audience online. But phone cameras are great, aren't they? They have what photographers describe as a wide-angle lens, which basically just means they're quite zoomed out. And that means that you can hold it at arm's length and take a selfie, and get more in the frame than just your nostrils. But wide-angle lenses have many more practical uses as well. They're great for taking shots of sprawling vistas like landscapes, cityscapes, all the tabs I have open in my browser, or things like architecture where you can't get too far away but you still need to try and get something really large in your shot. And camera lenses of all different kinds, wide angle, standard lenses, long lenses, have been around for many, many years at this point. Except for a short period in the 1930s and 40s, just as the SLR camera, which is the ancestor to most professional cameras today, was just hitting the market in a small enough form factor that it started to be a viable choice for photographers. No wide-angle lenses were available for that camera for 14 years after it was released. And given that the other kinds of camera on the market at the time did have wide-angle lenses available, it just seems strange that the hot new camera on the block had such a limited range of lenses available compared to its competitors for quite so many years. So let's work out why this happened. It's tempting to imagine the story of progress, the story of human innovation, as a steady progression of forward steps. But more often than not, when you solve a problem, it comes with trade-offs. You take two steps forward and one step back. And such was the case with the SLR camera, because it was created to solve a very specific problem. Because you'd think that in order for a camera to do its job well, it just needs to do one thing. It needs to see an image and record it on something, whether that's film, a digital sensor, whatever it might be. But when you think it through, it actually has a second job, which is arguably just as important, which is that before the film sees the image that the camera is seeing, the photographer needs to see it. And showing that same image to the film and to the photographer is mechanically more difficult than you might think. Now, historically, that challenge has been approached in a couple of different ways. The twin lens reflex camera, for example, as the name suggests, has two lenses, one which the film can see through, and one which the photographer can see through is attached to a viewfinder. And those lenses are positioned one above the other. So what the photographer sees is actually slightly higher than what the film is seeing. Rangefinder cameras had a similar setup where the photographer would look through a viewfinder which was slightly offset from what the lens itself was seeing. And the fact that in both these systems, the photographer and the film were seeing very slightly different angles of the scene didn't really matter. Like if your subject was a reasonable distance away from you, the difference is negligible. The problem comes when you have objects in the scene which are a bit closer to you, and you get what's called a parallax effect. And that's that effect when you hold your finger up to your face and you can see two different fingers, because your eyes are in two different positions and they see the world slightly differently. So the dream was to come up with a camera system that would let both the photographer and the film look directly through the camera lens and see the exact same scene before taking the shot. And this is where the SLR, the single lens reflex camera, came to save the day. You see, when light enters the lens, it ends up hitting a diagonal mirror, which bounces the light upwards and through a focusing lens. For early SLRs, like the Ihagi Kine Exacta, which was the first SLR to really hit the market in a format that was viable for photographers, the photographer would look down into that mirror and take the shot from above. Later models introduced a pentaprism above that mirror, which would bounce the light out the back of the camera through a viewfinder, which is the setup that we're all familiar with today. Now, obviously, that diagonal mirror is in the way of the film. So when the photographer hits the shutter, that mirror flips up, the viewfinder briefly goes dark, and the film is allowed to record the scene. And this method completely removes that parallax effect, because both the photographer and the film are seeing exactly the same scene, exactly as the lens sees it. And as this type of camera started to hit the market, along with it came a range of lenses, standard lenses, telephoto lenses, but no wide-angle lenses. What had gone wrong? So to understand the problem here, we need to talk about something called focal length. And it's something we've alluded to already. It's just a measure of how zoomed in or zoomed out you are. So when we talk about wide angle lenses, which as we said are quite zoomed out, or standard lenses, which are more in the range of what we see with our eyes, or telephoto lenses, which are really zoomed in on objects off in the distance, those are all categories of focal length. But photographers measure focal length much more specifically in a number in millimeters. And each lens will have that number in millimeters as their focal length. And that's how you tell how zoomed in or zoomed out they are. 
And a competent photographer will be able to look at any given scene and any given camera and know roughly what sort of focal length they will need in order to capture that scene in the way that they want to. But you can have the most in-depth knowledge of all your lenses and all your focal lengths and still never have to actually stop and ask what that number is actually measuring. For example, here I have a 17 to 70 millimeter lens. But which part of that lens is actually 17 millimeters? Like if I were to pick up a tape measure right now, where am I looking to find that 17 millimeter dimension? And this is probably the part of the video which is going to get the highest number of people shouting in the comments, so wish me luck. So let's imagine the simplest camera lens possible, one thin piece of glass. Think of a magnifying glass on the end of a cup. We've cut the end of the cup off. And we're going to focus that lens on infinity. So off into the buildings in the distance, or the mountains in the distance, or volcano. I don't know where you live. The important bit is when it's focused on infinity, the light rays bouncing off those objects way off in the distance and hitting the lens are coming in more or less parallel to each other. Let's assume they're truly parallel. And because of physics, the lens bends those light rays in towards each other. This is called refraction. And the point at which those light rays converge into a single point, into a single sharp image, is called the focal plane. And obviously when constructing a camera lens, this is where you'll want your film to be. And so the focal length of a lens is the distance from the focal plane to the hypothetical point where all that refraction is happening. And this is called the principal image plane. And in our simple magnifying glass lens, the principal image plane is just in the middle of the lens. Now the reason I say the principal image plane is hypothetical is because the real world lenses don't just have that one piece of glass at the front, but they have lots of different glass elements which interact in lots of different ways and refract the light in lots of different ways. But whatever the configuration, you can always model this refraction as happening at a single point, which is where you put the principal image plane. The main thing to understand at this point is that the wide angle lenses that were available for rangefinders at the time had their principal image plane somewhere inside the lens. So that's the thing we're measuring. And basically the lower the focal length number, the more zoomed out you are, the higher the focal length number, the more zoomed in you are. So when we talk about wide angle lenses, specifically what numbers are we looking at? Well, there's no hard cutoff for what makes a wide angle lens and what makes a standard lens. But generally speaking for SLRs at the time, a focal length below about 35 millimeters would be in the range of a wide angle lens. Which means that for the wide angle lenses available at the time, they would have had to been placed less than 35 millimeters away from the camera film. Can you see the problem? Uh, yeah, there's a mirror in the way. So while you could happily place a wide angle lens on a rangefinder camera, because you can place the lens as close to the camera film as you like, this absolutely would not work on an SLR, because if you tried that, the lens will get a kick in the butt from the mirror and there's broken glass everywhere. And so for 14 years, there were no SLR lenses available that were wider than about 40 millimeters, which is roughly the field of view you get with your eyes. It's very much not a wide angle lens. Some inventive people did manage to lock up the mirror in their SLR and manually strap on a wide angle rangefinder lens to their SLR. But with the mirror gone, you can't see through the viewfinder. So framing up the shot would just be guesswork or involve an external viewfinder, which means you might as well just use a rangefinder camera. And while these photographers were grumpily sellotaping rangefinder lenses to the front of their SLR, they must have been thinking, wouldn't it be great if someone in the cinematography industry had patented a device in 1931 which would solve this problem for us? Horace William Lee was a British optical engineer who'd already made important strides in the cinematography industry back in the 1920s. In 1924, he introduced his OPIC lens, which was the first F2 lens ever made available for cinematography. All that meant was it let in a lot more light than previous lenses, which was an absolute game changer for cinema at the time when they were trying to increase frame rates and deal with lower light conditions. Within a few years, he'd turned his attention to another problem, Technicolor. Not the idea of filming in colour itself, that had already been solved by somebody else. But with it came some trade-offs. Two steps forward, one step back. You see, the way that Technicolor filming apparatus worked at the time was it involved a beam-splitting prism, which took in the light from the lens and split it off into red, green, and blue. And then each of those three colors was recorded on a separate film strip. And this prism took up space between the lens and the film strip. 
Sound familiar? So years before regular photographers began buying SLRs, Lee was already wrestling with this problem of how to use wide-angle lenses in cinematography when this prism was in the way. And one day he picked up a telephoto lens, which was the exact opposite of what he needed. Because remember, telephoto lenses are really zoomed in when the goal here was to shoot wide, to shoot zoomed out. But at this point in history, telephoto lenses were pulling some interesting optical trickery. Think back to our discussion on focal length. So when we were talking about our simple lens, the magnifying glass on the end of a cup, we said that the principal image plane was roughly in the middle of that piece of glass. So the focal length in that situation was the distance between the piece of glass and where you want your camera film to be. Which means if you want a really zoomed in lens, say an 800 millimeter lens, you would need a lens which is 800 millimeters long which just isn't very practical. So decades earlier, optical engineers had asked themselves the question, if this principal image plane is just a hypothetical point, does it need to be inside the lens barrel? Or can we move it outside the lens, way out in front? Because that would mean we can make the lens barrel smaller. We can make these lenses smaller to carry around without compromising the focal length. And they achieved that by combining different glass elements to refract the light in a way that would allow them to make the lens physically smaller. Now, there are lots of different types of glass elements which get used inside lenses, and we don't need to worry about most of them. The two types we need to think about here are positive groups and negative groups. Positive groups do what our magnifying glass was doing. They bend the light rays towards each other. They make them converge. Whereas negative groups do the opposite. They bend the light rays away from each other. They diverge. So what they did was combine a strong positive lens group with a negative lens group. They bent the light in and then out again. This made for a much smaller lens barrel, but it meant when you calculate the position of this principal image plane, it's way out in front of the lens. It keeps that long focal length intact. And it was this trick of moving the principal image plane outside the actual body of the lens that really interested Lee, because he was looking at it and thought, do you think we could maybe just some... Um Now, obviously it wasn't as simple as literally taking a telephoto lens and just turning it around. But the challenge Lee set himself was if telephoto lenses are moving the principal image plane out in front, could wide angle lenses move the principal image plane out behind the lens? And that's what he did. In 1931, Lee patented an inverted telephoto lens, which took the idea of a telephoto lens, which had a strong positive lens group at the front to bend the light in and a negative group to bend the light out again, and flipped it. So the lens had a strong negative group at the front, which made the light rays diverge, move away from each other, and then brought them back together again with a positive lens group. And the result of that was the principal image plane, which remember is a hypothetical point, it matters mathematically but it's not a physical thing, was able to move out behind the lens. And the fact that the prism was there didn't matter. The focal length still worked. And this allowed wide angle lenses to be used in cinematography with this new Technicolor filming gear. And eventually, years later, as the SLR began growing in popularity, people noticed. It wasn't until 1950, nearly 20 years after Lee's inverted telephoto patent, that a French designer, Pierre Ingenue, came out with the retrofocus lens that things really started to click. This lens was truly successful in applying the inverted telephoto principle to an SLR lens, allowing it to be attached to an SLR camera with enough back clearance for the mirror while still achieving a truly wide angle focal length. And it was so widely accepted that Ingenue had truly nailed it that every manufacturer quickly adopted his design. And the name Retrofocus, which was originally the specific name of his product, became a generic term for any lens that uses this design. So the mirror clearance problem was solved and the way was paved for the wide angle lenses that SLR and later DSLR lenses use right up until today. But one would still be justified in asking why it took so long from the SLR becoming widely available in 1936 to the wide angle lens becoming available in 1950. What was the big delay? Well, there are two main things and neither of them really have anything to do with the problem being difficult to solve. Firstly, there was something fairly major going on between 1939 and 1945 that took up quite a lot of people's attention. Optical engineers at the time weren't really focused on helping people take nice landscape photos. Their ingenuity was being used for more military matters. And secondly, it just took a little while for people to become interested in SLRs. They had their rangefinders, and the parallax problem that the SLR wanted to fix 
wasn't a huge enough deal to quickly change over to a new system. It wasn't really until after the war when the Contax S and cameras from Pentax came along, and they had that pentaprism at the top, which meant you didn't have to look down at the mirror, but you could have a normal viewfinder on the back of the camera, that the SLRs really started to pick up in popularity. And then the demand built for wide-angle lenses. Up until really quite recently, probably no more than about 10 years ago, if you imagined a professional camera, you were probably imagining a DSLR, the digital SLR, which was the successor to the original SLR we've been talking about. But really quite quickly, camera technology has evolved in such a way that it's made pretty much every major manufacturer abandon the DSLR in favour of a new system the mirrorless camera. That diagonal mirror, which caused all these problems for wide-angle lenses in the first place, is finally being laid to rest. And manufacturers are so pleased about it that they're literally calling these new cameras mirrorless, celebrating the fact that it's gone. The new solution to allow photographers to see through the camera lens in the way that the SLR did is a digital one. The viewfinder has just been replaced by a screen. Now, early models certainly had their flaws, most notably that pressing your eye up to a tiny little screen was a far worse experience than looking directly through the lens with the mirror system that the DSLR had. Two steps forward, one step back. But those problems are being addressed at such a rate that while you can still get hold of a brand new DSLR, all the ones available are several years out of date by now. They haven't been updated with all the latest technology. And at this point, they probably never will. And it's also making a huge impact on lens design, because while the retrofocus design is still very common for wide-angle lenses, the fact that the mirror is gone, and once again, you can put the lens really close to the camera sensor, we're seeing smaller and sharper wide-angle lenses than ever before. So that's the end of the mirror clearance problem. All it took was a little bit of time and a little bit of ingenuity. That's a terrible place to end, but that's where we're ending. If you enjoyed this video, please do subscribe. Please consider buying me a coffee as well. That'll help these videos come out more regularly and I'll see you in the next one.